There were nabobs in those days, in the flesh times, I mean. Every rich strike in the mines created one or two. I called to mind several of these. They were careless, easy-going fellows as a general thing, and the community at large was as much benefited by their riches as they were themselves, possibly more in some cases. Two cousins, teamsters, did some hauling for a man and had to take a small, segregated portion of a silver mine in lieu of $300 cash. They gave an outsider a third to open the mine, and they went on teaming. But not long. Ten months afterward, the mine was out of debt and paying each owner 8000 to $10,000 a month, say $100,000 a year. One of the earliest nabobs that Nevada was delured wore $6,000 worth of diamonds in his bosom and, was, and swore he was unhappy because he could not spend his money as fast as he made it. Another Nevada nabob boasted an income that often reached 16000 a month. And he used to love to tell how he had worked in the very mine that yielded it for $5 a day when he first came to the country. The Silver and Sagebrush State was as knowledge of another of these pet fortunes, lifted from actual poverty to affluence almost in a single night who was able to offer $100,000 for a position of high official distinction shortly afterward, and did offer it, but failed to get it, his politics not being as sound as his bank account. Then there was John Smith. He was a good, honest, kind-hearted soul, born and reared in the lower ranks of life and miraculously ignorant. He drove a team and owned a small ranch, a ranch that paid him a comfortable living, for although it yielded but little hay, what little it did yield was worth 250 to 300 in gold per ton in the market. Presently, Smith traded a few acres of the ranch for a small, undeveloped silver mine in Gold Hill. He opened the mine and built a little unpretending ten-stamp mill. Eight months afterward, he retired from the hay business, for his mining income had reached a most comfortable figure. Some people said it was 30000 a month, others said it was 60000 Smith was very rich at any rate, and then he went to Europe and traveled. When he came back, he was never tired of telling about the fine hogs he had seen in England, and the gorgeous sheep he had seen in Spain, and the fine cattle he had noticed in the vicinity of Rome. He was full of wonders of the old world and advised everybody to travel. He said a man never imagined what surprising things there were in the world till he had traveled. One day on board ship, the passengers made up a pool of $500, which was to be the property of the man who should come nearest to guessing the run of the vessel for the next 24 hours. Next day towards noon, the figures were all in the purser's hands in sealed envelopes. Smith was serene and happy, for he had been bribing the engineer. But another party won the prize. Smith said, hey, there, that won't do. He guessed two miles wider of the mark than I did. The purser said, Mr. Smith, you missed it further than any man on board. We traveled 208 miles yesterday. Well, sir, said Smith, that's just where I've got you, for I guessed 209. If you look at my figures again, you'll find a two and two zeros, which stands for 200, don't it? And after them you'll find a nine, which stands for two hundred and nine. I reckon I'll take that money, if you please. The Gould and Curry claim comprised twelve hundred feet, and it belonged originally to the two men whose name it bears. Mr. Curry owned two-thirds of it, and he said he sold it out for twenty-five hundred dollars in cash and an old plug horse, that ate up his market value in hay and barley in seventeen days by the watch, and he said that Gould sold out for a pair of second-hand government blankets and a bottle of whiskey that killed nine men in three hours, and, and that an unoffending stranger that smelt the cork was disabled for life. Four years afterward, the mine thus disposed of was worth, in the San Francisco market, seven million... $600,000 in gold coin. 
In the early days, a poverty-stricken Mexican who lived in a canyon directly back of Virginia City had a stream of water as large as a man's wrist trickling from the hillside on his premises. The Ophir Company segregated a hundred feet of their mine and traded it to him for the stream of water. The hundred feet proved to be the richest part of the entire mine. Four years after the swap, its market value, including its mill, was one million five hundred thousand dollars. An individual who owned twenty feet in the Ophir mine before its great riches were revealed to men traded it for a horse, and a very sorry-looking brute it was, too. A year or so afterwards, when Ophir stock went up to three thousand dollars a foot, this man, who had not a cent, used to say, the most startling example of magnificence and misery the world has ever seen, because he was able to ride a $60,000 horse, yet could not scrape up enough cash to buy a saddle, and was obliged to borrow one or ride bareback. He said if fortune were to give him another $60,000 horse, it would ruin him. A youth of 19 who was a telegraph operator in Virginia on a salary of $100 a month, and who, when he could not make out German names in the list of San Francisco steamer arrivals, used to ingeniously select and supply substitutes for them out of an old Berlin city directory, made himself rich by watching the mining telegrams that passed through his hands and buying and selling stocks accordingly, through a friend in San Francisco. Once when a private dispatch was sent from Virginia announcing a rich strike in a prominent mine, advising that the matter be kept secret till a large amount of the stock could be secured. He bought 40 feet of the stock at $20 a foot and afterward sold half of it at $800 a foot and the rest at double that figure. Within three months, he was worth $150,000 and had resigned his telegraphic position. Another telegraph operator, who had been discharged by the company for divulging the secrets of the office, agreed with a moneyed man in San Francisco to furnish him with a result of a great Virginia mining lawsuit within an hour after its private reception by the parties to it in San Francisco. For this he was to have a large percentage of the profits on purchases and sales made on it by his fellow conspirator. So he went, disguised as a teamster, to a little wayside telegraph office in the mountains, got acquainted with the operator, and sat in the office day after day, smoking his pipe, complaining that his team was fagged out and unable to travel, and meantime listening to the dispatches as they passed clicking through the machine from Virginia. Finally, the private dispatch announcing the results of the lawsuit sped over the wires, and as soon as he heard it, he telegraphed his friend in San Francisco, Am tired waiting. Shall sell team and go home. It was a signal agreed upon. The word waiting left out would have signified that the suit had gone the other way. The mock teamster's friend picked up a deal of the mining stock at low figures before the news became public and a fortune was the result. For a long time after one of the Virginia mines had been incorporated, about fifty feet of the original location were still in the hands of a man who had never signed the incorporation papers. The stock became very valuable and every effort was made to find this man before he had disappeared. Once it was heard that he was in New York, and one or two speculators went east but failed to find him. Once the news came that he was in Bermuda, and straight away a speculator or two hurried east and sailed for Bermuda, but he was not there. Finally, he was heard of in Mexico, and a friend of his, a barkeeper on a salary, scraped together a little money and sought him out and bought his feet for a hundred dollars, returned and sold the property for seventy-five thousand. But why go on? The traditions of Silverland are filled with instances like these, and I never get through enumerating them were I to attempt to do it. 
I only desired to give the reader an idea of the peculiarity of the flush times, which I could not present so strikingly in any other way, and which some mention of was necessary to realizing comprehension of the time and the country. I was personally acquainted with the majority of the nabobs I have referred to, and so for old acquaintance sake I have shifted their occupations and experiences around in such a way as to keep the, the Pacific public from recognizing these once notorious men. No longer notorious, for the majority of them have drifted back into poverty and obscurity again. In Nevada there used to be a current story of an adventure or two of, the, of her nabobs which may or may not have occurred. I give it for what it's worth. Colonel Jim had seen somewhat of the world and knew more or less of its ways, but Colonel Jack was from the back settlements of the States, had led a life of arduous toil, and had never seen a city. These two, blessed with sudden wealth, projected a visit to New York. Colonel Jack to see the sights, and Colonel Jim to guard his unsophistication from misfortune. They reached San Francisco in the night and sailed in the morning. Arrived in New York, Colonel Jack said, I've heard tell of carriages all my life, and now I mean to have a ride in one. I don't care what it costs. Come along. They stepped out on the sidewalk, and Colonel Jim called a stylish baroche. But Colonel Jack said, No, sir, none of your cheap John turnouts for me. I'm here to have a good time, and money ain't any object. I mean to have the knobbiest rig that's going. Now here comes the very trick. Stop that yaller one with the pictures on it. Don't you fret. I'll stand all the expenses myself. So Colonel Jim stopped an empty omnibus, and they got in. Said Colonel Jack, Ain't it gay, though? Oh, no, I reckon not. Cushions and windows and pictures till you can't rest. What would the boys say if they see us cutting a swell like this in New York? By George, I wish they could see us. Then he put his head out the window and shouted to the driver, Say, Johnny, this suits me. Suits yours truly. You bet you. I want this shebang all day. I'm on it, old man. Let him out. Make him go. We'll make it all right with you, Sonny. The driver passed his hand through the strap hole and tapped for his fare. It was before the gongs came into common use. Colonel Jack took the hand, shook it cordially, and he said, You twig me, old pard. All right, between gents. Smell that, and then see how you like it. And he put a twenty-dollar gold piece in the driver's hand. After a moment, the driver said he could not make change. Bother the change. Write it out. Put it in your pocket. Then to Colonel Jim, with a sounding slap on his thigh, ain't it style, though? Hanged if I don't hire this thing every day for a week. The omnibus stopped, and a young lady got in. Colonel Jack stared a moment, then nudged Colonel Jim with his elbow. Don't say a word, he whispered. Let her ride if she wants to. Gracious, there's room enough. The young lady got out her portemonnaie and handed her fare to Colonel Jack. What's this for, said he. Give it to the driver, please. Take back your money, madam. We can't allow it. You're welcome to ride here as long as you please. But this shebang's chartered, and we can't let you pay a cent. The girl shrunk into a corner, bewildered. An old lady with a basket climbed in and proffered her fare. Excuse me, said Colonel Jack. You're perfectly welcome here, madam, but we can't allow you to pay. Set right down there, mum, and don't you be the least uneasy. Make yourself as free as you was in your own turnout. Within two minutes, three gentlemen, two fat women, and a couple of children entered. Come right along, friends, said Colonel Jack. Don't mind us. This is a free blowout. Then he whispered to Colonel Jim. New York ain't no sociable place, I don't reckon. There ain't no name for it. He resisted every effort to pass fares to the driver and made everybody cordially welcome. The situation dawned on the people, and they pocketed their money and delivered themselves up to covert enjoyment of the episode. Half a dozen more passengers entered. Oh, there's plenty of room, said Colonel Jack. Walk right in and make yourself at home. A blowout ain't worth anything as a blowout unless a body has company. 
Then in a whisper to Colonel Jim, but ain't these New Yorkers friendly? And ain't they cool about it, too? Icebergs ain't anywhere. I reckon they tackle a hearse that was going their way. More passengers got in. More yet, and still more. Both seats were filled, and a file of men were standing up holding on to the cleats overhead. Parties with baskets and bundles were climbing up on the roof. Half-suppressed laughter rippled from all sides. Well, for clean, cool, out-and-out -out cheek, if this don't bang anything I ever saw, I'm an Injun, whispered Colonel Jack. A Chinaman crowded his way in. I weakened, said Colonel Jack. Hold on, driver. Keep your seats, ladies and gents. Just make yourselves free. Everything's paid for. Driver, rustle these folks around as long as they're mine to go. Friends of ours, you know. Take them everywheres, and if you want more money... Come to the St. Nicholas, and we'll make it all right. Pleasant journey to you, ladies and gents. Just go along as long as you please. It ain't, it shan't cost you a cent. The two comrades got out, and Colonel Jack said, Jimmy, it's the sociablest place I ever saw. The Chinaman waltzed in as comfortable as anybody. If we'd stayed a while, I reckon we'd had some niggers. By George, we'll have a barricade our doors tonight. Some of those ducks will be trying to sleep with us.